Uh, today we're talking about building next-gen uh, enterprise mobile applications. Uh, just a little bit about me before we sort of continue on. So just a little bit about me. I'm obviously not originally from Norwich. Uh, I moved here about two years ago. Like many people, I kind of just came here one afternoon and then came back one more afternoon and never went home. Um, I started a software company not long after I came to the UK. Uh, we mostly build mobile applications, uh, enterprise web architectures, that sort of stuff. Um, so my company's based here in Norwich. We have an office in Croatia now. We have an office in the United States as well, so we're growing quite quickly. The whole mobile thing is, as everyone knows, you know, taking off. So that's pretty much what we do. So what we're going to talk about today is, is basically enterprise applications and, and mobile in particular. So to give you a bit of an idea and a bit of a history, the old way of building enterprise apps, the very old way for anyone that remembers doing this, one-to-one -one connection. So we'd have a server, some database, something locally inside the building. All the computers would connect to it, whether that was a mainframe and Citrix boxes or whatever, but that was it. It was dead simple. We got a little bit more complicated, sort of mid-90s, 2000s. And what we'd end up with was you know, enterprise middleware connecting to our databases in the back end. A lot of that sort of stuff got exposed via the internet. And it was kind of dumb, you know, dumb, dumb UI. So we had web pages. They weren't particularly great. This wasn't a period where we had like, uh, high levels of jQuery and all that sort of stuff. Very service-centric networks. But we did end up with global reach. What we're finding now, though, is we're kind of moving towards more loosely defined systems. So cloud architectures bring your own devices becoming very popular. And this sort of stuff really is happening. So I've worked for companies like Accenture, insurance agencies, you know, big companies, and they are into this. They are very, very much into this. So to give you an example, I built an iPad application for an insurance company. This insurance company, even now, was going to, you know, their, their potential client, they were going to their house, big stack of paperwork, working through the entire thing. That was it. Now it's all bring your own device, they're all made to get an iPad. They will enter this stuff in via an iPad. It all syncs to a remote server, all that kind of thing. So this is kind of more what enterprise architecture is starting to look like. It's a lot looser. There's a lot more to it. So we've still got that whole enterprise middleware. We've still got all these databases. But we're exposing them not just to web interfaces or you know, uh, remote computers or whatever, but tablets, phones, devices, televisions, cars, all sorts of things. And on top of that, we're ending up with a whole social component, an entire messaging component, and SaaS in cloud servers and other things are coming in on top of that as well. So we've got a really a much broader definition of enterprise architecture now. It's not so constrained, it's not so defined as it used to be. So mobility first. Has anyone heard that term? So this is a big thing in a lot of enterprises. It's mobility first. Whenever they're signing off any new software project, they are essentially going, is this thing mobile? If it's not, they don't do it. It's happening a lot. It's happening everywhere. US, you know, the UK, all the enterprise clients we talk to now, they're all very much mobility first. And if you're doing any kind of enterprise development at all and not investing in mobile, you've got no future. That's just the short and curly of it. You know, the, the, it's, you cannot continue on the old way we were doing things with you know, enterprise desktop apps, sure, they'll still be around, but that isn't the be all and end all. Everything's becoming much, much more mobile, and that's what people want, and that's what enterprise wants. <coughs> so, a few interesting facts about that mobile phones are now more ubiquitous than indoor plumbing. So, there's more, more mobile phones, more smartphones in the world than there are toilets. Apple's iPhone has higher sales than everything Microsoft sells. Just that device alone in 2012 made more money than everything Microsoft sells. There's 5.6 billion phone subscribers in the world, 85% of the entire human population. And we're not even talking about, you know, if you go to Africa, they've still, they've got like a feature phone economy in Africa, you know, they do their banking on old feature phones. So this whole thing hasn't even, you know, gotten out to, to places like that yet. We don't even have smartphone economies happening in, in places like Africa. Places like China are booming, you know, like iPhone sales and other things uh, are worth billions of dollars in China already, uh, and it's getting massive. So it's pretty easy to see why enterprises are being pushed into this new mobile-first world. 
Uh, it's not all doom and gloom, it is quite complicated, but at the end of the day, um, you know, you can cut through all that with, uh, with, with some pretty nifty tools. Uh, one of the big things is the cost of running enterprise infrastructure is now lower than ever. So it's good news for software companies. Uh, the barriers of entry are lower than ever before with cloud tech, mobile backend as a service, cross-platform tools. It's now pretty much rightly possible to compete with all the major players and still deliver the same, if not higher, qualities of service and qualities of product. So how we do it. So how we do it at Tipsy and Tumblr. First of all, it's all about choosing the right backend solution for us. So whether we end up with a client, you know, we make a decision when a client comes to us. Are we going to choose a, an MBAS, mobile backend as a service product, PaaS, platform as a service product, uh, or does this product need its own VPS servers? Do we need cloud servers? Does it need dedicated hardware? So nine tenths of the time, what we end up with is a solution that generally uses a mobile backend as a service or a platform as a service. Most of the time, the other two aren't necessary but there are some times when they are. So to try to work that out, is a solution an app? Now, nearly everything we build now is, 90% of the software we build, it's I want an app, I want an app, I want an app, I want an app. So when we're thinking about this, we, we, we consider does it need a fully validated content entry system? So does it need some web system or something that you build that puts the data in the right structure and ensures it's all validated and all these kind of things. Does it need that? Do you need to ensure user scalability? And are you okay with them that I am? So if you can answer yes to all those questions, then MBAS might be an answer. So what is it exactly? Pre-built cloud-hosted components. They allow the developer to focus on software core features instead of lower level tasks. Reduce the time and complexity to building cloud-connected mobile apps. So has anyone heard of any of these systems? PARS, StackMob, Kinvi, that sort of stuff? So they're some of the MBAS providers. So Kinvi and PARS, they're, they're two of the big ones. PARS was recently bought out by Facebook for a couple of billion dollars or some ridiculous amount of money. Not quite as ridiculous as WhatsApp, but not far off. Uh, and there's, there's, there's a few others. There's open source products. There's products that run on Java. There's products that run you know, Node.js. There's, there's all kinds, so pretty much you know, whatever language or, or framework you're comfortable with, there's, there's a mobile backend as a service product that will work for you. One of the big ones was StackMob. That was bought by PayPal about six months ago, 12 months ago. And six months later, they shut the entire thing down. So unfortunately for everyone that invested all their time and money into that, that's one of the issues with these MBAS products. You are tied into that vendor. And once you're tied into that vendor, if they decide to do something like this and close it down, you have to be aware that it's more difficult to pick this stuff up and move it elsewhere. So we're going to talk specifically about PARS a little bit. PARS is a system that we go to the most. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. Primarily one of them is cost. So they have a very, very good user, a very good pricing scaling program. So it starts off for free, you get a million requests a month, a million push notifications a month. Uh, quite good bandwidth and everything else. You get all the core platform, which includes analytics and um, cloud code and these other kinds of things. Um, and, and it's a good way, you know, you can build an app on this and scale it up on the free plan. It will work completely fine. But, you know, if you end up needing more power or more features or whatever, getting up to their pro plans are only about $200 a month. It's really quite cheap for that kind of architecture, for that kind of infrastructure. And then enterprise features as well. So we've used this enterprise stuff before and it works out to something like $1,000 a month, which if you're looking at enterprise infrastructure is actually really quite cheap. So what's included? Most of these tools are kind of the same, so this is, this is some of the stuff with PARS, but generally they all have pretty much the same features. Uh, push notification systems, a web management tool, which in PARS' case includes the ability to create custom classes like you would a database table. Uh, cloud code, what they call cloud code, so you can write your own functions and execute those against that database uh, and do sort of internal workers and things like that. That uses Node.js in their case. Um, they have inbuilt user management and login systems, so all these kind of things are standard across the others as well. Uh, they start off with one gig of file storage or 10 gig once you start paying $199 a month. Uh, background jobs and analytics as well. So all this is packaged up into this nice, 
nice, you know, neat little package that you can basically just start using straight out of the box. The data management, it's really quite simple. Uh, even if you have clients and they don't want to invest time and money into building their own web administration system or anything like that, this is just kind of like Excel. You know, obviously it comes with the caveat of if they go and break something, it's broken, but if that's their choice and their decision, you know, they can quickly and easily edit structure uh, using this system here. So you can enter data in just like you would a spreadsheet. Uh, you can create columns and, and new items and import data just like you would any old Excel spreadsheet. It's got helpful import tools. Uh, they all use the JSON data format, so you know, very mobile friendly. Uh, you can create pointers and relations that essentially mirror, mimic foreign keys in a, in a database management system. So just like you would in MySQL, create a foreign key from one table to another. You can do a similar sort of thing in PARS, and it will actually bring back those related objects whenever you query for something. So it's quite handy. So there's loads of SDK options for these things. Whether you develop apps natively or use cross-platform tools like we do, uh, PARS has an iOS SDK, Android SDK, a JavaScript SDK, a REST API. All the bases are covered, so it doesn't really matter what kind of platform you're using, there's something there that will actually work. They have a secure API for performing import tasks and other queries. So they have a full-blown API set if you want to do you know, data structure changes or you want to run jobs and, and hit things against their REST API, that's all possible. And of course, you can always scale up to higher plans as and when you need to. The downsides with these sorts of systems, less granular control. So that's one of the things I think many developers find hard to let go of. You can't go in there and you know, change how indexing works or how the search queries work against the class or anything like that. They're all pre-built components, so you are kind of constrained to the feature set that they're providing you. If you're doing a lot of reporting or you know, long-running queries, like you might run against a, a SQL server, um, that sort of stuff can be extremely slow. So it's all based on NoSQL. It's not the best mechanism for doing reporting. And data administration can be much slower than if your database is on a local server or network. So the trade-off of having this thing in the cloud is obviously if you go and build a web administration system or something that connects to it, it's not all together. It's not in the same place. It's not in the same network. It's not on the same hardware. You know, it's going to be slower than it would be if it was all you know, on the same server. So on the flip side, we've got PaaS. So PaaS providers, platform as a, as a service providers, there's quite a few. Um, Red Hat's probably one of the, the newer players, but they've been around for a long time. They've got quite a good service. Fort Rabbits in Germany, uh, also quite a good service, PHP oriented. Salesforce is large, obviously. Engine Yard's quite a big, uh, uh, popular one over here in the UK. So all these guys essentially provide a platform for you to upload an application to. So instead of creating hosting, you upload your stuff, you, you, know, you manage it, all that sort of stuff. They provide cartridges, for want of a better word, depending on which provider you use, they all have their own terminology. But they'll provide a cartridge, for example, say, that runs PHP, and you push your code to it via Git, and that's it. All you worry about is creating the bits of software, pushing the code up to the cloud, and they take care of everything else. All the ins and outs of the networking and the you know Apache setup or uh, Nginx setup or, or whatever they've got running, you know that's all hidden from you. So it's highly scalable. Uh, it's far more reliable and stable than shared hosting services. Anyone that's used shared hosting to attempt to build a product will find at some point that it falls over because they inevitably do. Uh, lower cost than cloud servers, VPSs, or dedicated hardware. Much lower cost. No need to run or manage server infrastructure. And it's far, far easier to move between pass vendors or to your own hardware or server infrastructure if you actually want to. So unlike MBAS where you're tied into a particular vendor, you're tied into their way of doing things, you're tied into their SDK, platform as a service, write whatever you, you know, your application, your code, your API, whatever it is, and whatever language you're comfortable with, upload it to their system. If you decide to move elsewhere, again, it's all just code, push it somewhere else, and off you go, change DNS, whatever, you can write it elsewhere. So it's all about taking that control of the hardware, taking that control of, 
of administrative setup, and it's all about code push and deploy. So it's good if you have a single software product that requires high scalability and uptime, <coughs> but requires custom APIs and or regular changes. So if those three things match, then pass could be the right option for you. So we tend to use this a lot when we have startup products, because as a startup, they tend to come to us, we build something, they change their mind six weeks later, we do that, they change their mind back to the way it was six weeks before, on and on it goes. So the platform as a service model works really well for, for particularly startups, but people that are you know, constantly iterating their products where you have to make changes that might otherwise not fit into an MBAS solution. So this is one of our products called LoyalZoo, which we run on PaaS hardware. It's all PHP API. Um, we were using an MBAS for this, and we've moved it off there for those reasons I just mentioned, which is the client is always continually changing how things work, uh, continually adding new things to their product, and continually doing that in a way that's outside of the regular MBAS infrastructure. So a VPS, dedicated hardware or cloud service solution, when do we need that? Does anyone know what this is? Specifically what that stuff is? Blade servers. 10, 12 years ago, I worked for a company before the whole cloud infrastructure and all that sort of stuff that invested really, really heavily into their architecture for their software and uh, sorry, their, their hardware for their software and all that sort of stuff. Now, their system was a little bit taller than this, perhaps, but that at the time cost over a million dollars. So, I mean, what is this? 700,000 pounds? 600,000 pounds? So that's, that's just it. One, one rack of servers costs 700,000 pounds. Today, we can essentially perform the same task they were doing, which is all these small servers that can be popped in and popped out easily, you know, configured to do different tasks and whatever redundancy. We can configure all that on cloud infrastructure within about five minutes. And the cost, to give you an idea, that same system they paid a million dollars for, I built similar things that had similar functions and it costs a couple hundred quid a month. So that's the difference. That's, that's where we've gone from about 10 or 12 years ago to now. And it's good, primarily this whole cloud server infrastructure, it's good if your software solution needs fine granular control over security and or hardware resources. So to give you a rough idea of the kind of thing I'm talking about, we have one client, they have some cloud server infrastructure, it's all run on rack space, we have load balancers and servers underneath and all that sort of stuff. And the reason we have that kind of architecture for this client is they have things running in the background. We have a server that generates these PDF files and digitally signs stuff. We have another server that crunches down a whole bunch of images and creates augmented reality files. So we have you know, these little bits and pieces that don't fit into a PaaS solution. They're not straight software. Uh, they definitely don't fit into a mobile backend as a service product because they're not simply straight, uh, straight up and down uh, flow book. They're not, they, you know, they're not straight up and down data calls to a server. So most common uh, solutions at cloud servers, easily set up, easily managed, easily duplicated. And this is one of the big things. So that easy duplication for us is massive. That means that we can go and create a clustered set of servers. We can create one server, get it right, and then go duplicate, 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 delete them all, turn them all off, back one up, do it all again, it takes five minutes. So the most common providers, Amazon, a lot of people have used Amazon. Uh, Rackspace, so I just mentioned, there's a few others, Cloud Beans, Amazon Yard. I'm gonna concentrate on Rackspace. They're the ones that we use the most for this kind of stuff. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them, one, one of the reasons a lot of people, sorry, tend to use Amazon more than the other services is that they're cheap. They are very cheap. But Rackspace, in my opinion, is far easier to use than Amazon. And the big thing is the support is awesome. So when you have a problem, you can get them on the phone, you can get them on live chat, they will fix it. Amazon doesn't. So that's the big thing for us. When we have clients and when we go and suggest hardware or, or network infrastructure, and when we're saying to them, look, it's going to cost 300 quid a month or whatever it's going to cost, they want to know that when a server blows up, someone on the other end will actually fix it. And we want to know that too. We don't want to be supporting hardware. So that's a big thing for us, and that's why we, we, we choose Rackspace over any other provider. So their whole system's pretty simple. I might give you a quick demo of this, actually, if we can get it to work. 
So this is this is our Rackspace account. So creating a server, but our, our account's actually based in the US because at the time when we set up an account with Rackspace, they didn't actually have a London office. They do now. You can do all this sort of stuff by generating servers in London or Dublin or Germany or wherever you want. But setting up servers now is basically as easy as this. Test server, choose the region you want, you know, choose the operating system you want. Let's go with CentOS, why not? The performance level that you want. So all this can be scaled up and down. What network you want, you can create your own private networks with this infrastructure as well. And that's it. It gives you a password, gives you an IP address, gives you an internal IP address, bang, you've got a server within five minutes. It will, it will take to build something like that. And it really is as easy as that. So, you know, we particularly use this sort of stuff a lot when we're doing uh, development testing. So we'll generate a server that has, you know, we, we know it's hard and it might be a PHP API or something that we generally put on this thing. We know it's hard and we know it's got all security down pat. We just create an image of this server. We go and save that image off once we're happy with the server and how it works. And then we can just select it and go, well, we need to copy that server again to do some testing or whatever it happens to be. So we'll go create a server. We've changed them. Ours are all first generation. So we can basically go, we need that, that LAMP base server up again. We need to do some development testing for this new product. So we can just select something that we know works. We can choose how much RAM we want for it, whatever we want. We can go, oh, we, need a, we need a testing box. And create it. And one of the great things about this is it's exactly the hardware we require. It's exactly the setup we want. A, a web designer or someone, for example, if you were using a CMS system and you just wanted to go and launch a product, they can just go into this thing and go, I need a new test box, blah, 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 create it. They don't have to ask hardware people to do it. They don't have to ask the software development people to do it. Anyone can pretty much launch these boxes, give it five minutes, everything's up and running. So they are extremely useful. Um, and, you know, th this kind of technology... Uh, quite frankly, you know, more than just a few years ago, it just basically didn't exist. So now that kind of stuff really allows us to compete with much, much larger companies who have much greater resources than we do. So as I just mentioned, you know, back up whatever you want, restore it, reuse it. On top of that, Rackspace offers all these things. Most of these other companies offer basically the same products. So cloud files, you know, it's common now people go and put all their image content, movie content, whatever it happens to be in CDNs so that if you're streaming it from a phone or from an iPad or whatever it happens to be, uh, you know, the, the, the most local uh, copy of that file to you is the one that gets used. Load balances, setting up a load balancer a few years ago was an absolute nightmare. This sort of stuff now, it's easy. You know, you can go and create enterprise level architecture and hardware within a couple of minutes. You don't have to worry about the ins and outs of setting up a load balance. You just go, I want one, and I want it to connect to these three machines here, and here's the IP address, and here's the SSL certificate for it, and off you go, create it for me. So that's great. Deployment stacks, these are just essentially pre-built you know, clusters, whether it's Apache, PHP, or, or Java, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, cloud databases, again, that's a big one. So you know, we're talking about redundancy, particularly redundancy for enterprise applications. That's one of the important things. It's one of the things enterprises are always harping on about they need to be redundant, it can't go down uptime, uptime, uptime. So cloud databases are essentially just a database that you don't have to manage the hardware for. So you can create a MySQL database or a Mongo database, whatever it happens to be. You can tell it you want it to be such a size and that you want it to scale and you just pay for whatever bandwidth and whatever you know, uh, disk space you're using essentially and it's all put on redundant hardware that you don't have to worry about. Message queues, so you know, if you're doing things like sending push notifications to a million people, you can't do all of that within a single web page. 
or a single process. So queues allow us to, to do that sort of stuff without having to worry about um, crashing. Auto scaling, you can create products much like a pass provider where it will scale depending on the hardware resources needed. So this sort of stuff is great if you run, say, a really popular blog or whatever it happens to be. Um, you can create it, it can run at low capacity most of the time and if all of a sudden you get mentioned by Stephen Fry on Twitter, you know it'll scale up and that your system's not going to crash. And big data. So that's kind of the back end of it. On top of that, uh, as far as the front end stuff goes, particularly with mobile, most people know me and we build most of our stuff with Accelerator. I've talked about it quite a few times before. Um, it's a, for those that don't know what it is, it's a cross-platform mobile tool. All the apps are basically built with JavaScript. It allows you to compile to iOS and Android. Uh, it has its own studio uh, IDE, so development environment. Uh, they have beta support out for Windows at the moment. They have BlackBerry 10 support. Uh, they did have Tizen support or whatever it is, but they dropped it because who cares? <laughs> <laughs> but um, so that, that's the tool we we use most often. So and the great thing with this sort of stuff is, you know, as a business, it helps us to be able to train staff quicker. We get wider coverage in a single platform, so we don't have to have people that know Java and people that know you know Objective C and then people that know .NET. Those skills are great, but we can train people first and foremost in the tool we use every day, which is this, and it's JavaScript. We can translate those JavaScript skills straight across to server infrastructure with Node.js, or we can transfer those skills you know, uh, to other places as well, desktop apps using it, web, web development, jQuery, whatever it happens to be. But we first and foremost concentrate now on JavaScript as a language, uh, and that's our primary, primary objective with all of our training. So it has native extensibility when required. So you know these these platforms, you can essentially build native modules. Um, you can write them in Objective C. You can expose the functions and whatever through a proxy, and then you can use them in your titanium with wow. JavaScript. They're actually changing how that works a little bit. They're, they're moving to a model of development that's kind of closer to how Zamarin works. Those kind of products, where you write JavaScript, but the way it's compiled underneath is completely different, so you can access native functions and things without having to write proxy objects or create native modules for each platform or whatever. Uh, the good thing with cross-platform tools, they're getting better all the time. So, you know, a few years ago they were pretty ordinary, um, but these kind of things, particularly as mobile hardware gets a lot better, these cross-platform tools get better and better all the time, there's no doubt about it. And the amount of interest I've seen from very, very big companies that want to use this sort of stuff is amazing. And the big thing for us, I mean, we're a small company, so you know, for us, one of the one of the major achievements is the fact that learning a cross-platform tool that allows us to target Android and iOS, and also gives our developers the skills in JavaScript to create web apps or Node.js or whatever it happens to be, is time and money. You know, we only have to train them in one language, and then they learn these platforms, and it costs us less. And it costs us less to produce an app, which means we can go after you know, large enterprises or whatever and compete on a cost basis and still be profitable. So it's really important. This is just an example of one of the apps we've built with, uh, with Titanium. This is a local little app that uh, basically works with, um, sorry, a local app that's uh, for classical music enthusiasts. Uh, it's on the app store, it's called Classical here. I think Emily's talked at some of the local Norwich uh, developer events before. So to kind of gauge how popular these cross-platform tools are, this is Gartner's magic quadrant. So it essentially just ranks companies and their capabilities and, and scope of their vision. <laughs> and scope of their vision. So to give you an idea, these are the mobile development companies that are the leaders essentially in the field. Accelerator, Kony, which is much more of an enterprise middleware platform, and jQuery mobile. There's no mobile development leaders that are you know, purely native frameworks. They're not there, because that's not what enterprises are looking for. They're looking, like we are, to be able to train staff in a single tool set and to, appear, to, to be able to build applications that are essentially are cross-platform, that reach across different sets of hardware and different devices and all that sort of stuff. So um, this was, I think, yeah, 2013. 
Um, and you can see the players that are sort of coming up as well, Sensure and Zamara. So these are all cross-platform tools. So mobile completeness. So the last kind of piece of this puzzle with enterprise mobile architectures is stuff that's not you know, specifically hardware, not specifically database, not specifically a mobile phone application, but things that have come in over the top of that, like push notifications. I mean, an app now without push notifications is kind of half finished. Everyone expects it, everyone wants it. It's extremely useful you know, for, for targeting customers or targeting users of a product. It's uh, an unbelievable asset to, to all enterprises that implement it. We tend to use Urban Airship for that because we just found them the most reliable system to use. As simple as that. Beacons, this year is probably going to be the year of beacons. They're probably going to start popping up in supermarkets everywhere. Uh, <coughs> shopping centers, all that sort of stuff. So er everyone know what beacons are? So beacons are essentially dumb devices that use Bluetooth light energy. And these dumb devices, they're about, some of them, well currently they're about this big. They sit on a wall over there and they might sit next to a rack of t-shirts. Now if you've got you know, the application on your phone for Gap or whoever, American Apparel or whatever it happens to be, when you walk past that little Bluetooth device, it will send push notifications directly to your phone, so locally to you. So it will essentially go, hey, you know, I, I think you might like these t-shirts, they're half price. And it's all coming onto your phone directly. So these beacons allow people to track, you know, when people come into a classroom, have the students attended or they need to sign a register, we know they've attended because they've got the application and we've been able to ping their phone over and over again. So this, this sort of technology is going to be massive this year. Estimotes is already sort of launched in the US. Gloomworm is a company based out of Amsterdam doing this. There's lots of little companies building these little uh, Bluetooth light energy devices. And the Internet of Things. So this is still quite new. It will be large. I don't think it'll be as large as some people believe it's going to be but it will definitely be one of the game changers. So we're talking about Google Glass, we're talking about smart watches, uh, you know, we're talking about connected cars, all this sort of stuff. So already the connected cars thing is going to be a massive market. Already in Japan, there's entire companies that they're just based on putting software, mobile software, into your car. It, it's, it's crazy, I've seen a demonstration by a company called Denso. They're based in Japan. And, and they built a game where people can sit in their car if they're waiting. There's this application, this game that runs on the screen and the dashboard, and it's like Pong. So they essentially have one car door open each, and they sit there and they do this. They open and shut the doors, and the thing, it's, it's crazy. So I'm sure there'll be far more useful purposes than that. But um, yeah, so mobile apps and this sort of mobile technology is just being launched into everything. <clears throat> So just to go back to this diagram again, this is kind of you know, the rough indication of what, and a very, very high level, obviously, enterprise architecture looks like today. And this is the sort of stuff we use for it. So just to highlight, you know, when we look at SaaS, we look at companies like PaaS, we look at companies like Accelerator has a cloud services product, we look at those kind of companies. Messaging with Urban Airship and a bunch of others. I won't really touch on social because everyone knows who the big players are in that game. Uh, we use Rackspace whenever we're creating databases or, or cloud file storage or you know, middleware, anything like that. And then on the front end, uh, all that mobile stuff is Accelerator generally. Uh, and I'm throwing Laravel in there too because when it comes to the web stuff, I think it's quite good. But. So to summarize, if you're looking to build mobile enterprise applications, the important thing is find a technology stack that works for you. So we found products that work for us. We found that Accelerator worked really well for us, that you know, uh, PARS as a, as a mobile backend service works really well for us. Urban Airship are the push notification system that works really well for us. But they may not work for you, but find the ones that do work for you, whether it's Zamarin and some other platform backend, whether it's uh, you know, PhoneGap and uh, Amazon Web Services, whatever it happens to be but find those providers in those certain areas that work for you and stick with them. Don't get left behind and increasingly move on for us well. So that's really important. So anyone that builds software now, uses .NET, uses Java, whatever it happens to be, don't get left behind. All software will eventually be mobile friendly or mobile orientated. Even if there's still desktop, 
obviously desktop software is going to last a long time. You know, even if we're still building backend services, even if you're a database guy, have no doubt that the future of all software is essentially mobile focused. So don't get left behind. Uh, there's never been a more level playing field than there is today. So, and that's really true. You know, 10 years ago, we couldn't have afforded to compete, particularly in hardware terms or, or just sheer manpower and, and all that sort of stuff with bigger companies. Like, we, we couldn't do it. We, we, without these cross-platform tools, we could not afford to have, you know, three or four iOS developers plus three or four Java developers plus people that knew how to manage hardware infrastructure and set up a load balancer and that you could call at three o'clock in the morning when the whole thing crashed. We couldn't afford to do that. Now we can. These platforms, these tools and, and companies that are offering pass and, and cloud servers and everything, they've made the, the playing field far more level for smaller businesses to be able to compete. And when it comes to building stuff, scale up as and when you need to with the tools you enjoy using. Uh, you don't need a lot of money to make a big impact. So that's kind of you know the point of it is you can use these tools to scale up with things as and when you need to. You don't have to have massive masses of investment to build a product, whether it's for you or for an enterprise customer, that you know needs tons and tons of money behind it. You can scale this stuff up as and when you need to do it, uh, and and just find the stuff that works for you. You know, if you don't like writing applications in titanium, then try Zamarin. There's plenty of these products around. Uh, find the ones that you like and enjoy using. Frankly, if you're not enjoying the kind of stuff you're building with, then you're not going to enjoy uh, the software development process very much anyway. So I think that's about it for me. Um, does anyone got any questions? Yeah, um, I noticed that you suggested using Urban Edge for push notifications. Mm -hmm. On the face of it, bars would seem to do very similar things yeah. for push notifications. So the reason we stuck with Urban Edge originally, we used Titanium. And the method that PARS was using for push notifications right up until about three weeks ago was their, their own custom background service, Android SDK thing. It was just a pain in the ass, frankly. And it was rubbish. Whether you were developing native apps or non-native apps like we were, their push notifi notification system for Android was crap. Now, they're using standard GCM, so standard Android push notifications, just like you would with any other provider. So if I was to go and build an application today, uh, we've invested a lot of money in Urban Airship already, so we might stick with it. But if, if I was you and developing one today, I'd use PARS as in built push notification system because it, now it is all standardized. You can write cloud code to, you know, check your users table every every day or whatever, and send those those users a, a push notification message. So yeah, most of these providers do have that sort of stuff. Um, it's just mostly for us at the time that Urban Airship was was the best provider, and PARS didn't really offer what we needed. Thanks. Um, if you have a major mobile OS upgrade, like from six, iOS 6 to 7, did, does that ever result in breakages of your yeah. sort of accelerating layer? It results in breakages whether you've got Accelerator or not. So the biggest one recently was from iOS 6 to 7. Mm -hmm. And everyone's apps, the status bar suddenly disappeared, and all their apps went 20 pixels further to the top than they used to be because they calculate now the top, you know, the, the, the zero point, left zero, top zero, of an application from underneath the status bar, whereas they used to calculate it from, uh, sorry, they calculate it to the same, to the top of the screen to where the status bar starts, where they used to calculate it from underneath the status bar, which meant all these applications that used positioning systems all broke. So titanium apps broke, you know, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't press a back button because it was underneath the status bar, all this sort of stuff, but that happened in native apps too. So it does happen. One of the things that I recommend whenever you build anything really, but particularly mobile because it does just change so often, make sure that any contract you, you create for customers, you put in that contract, we are not responsible for breakages or system changes implemented by providers that are out of our control. So we're not gonna go and update you know, 10 apps for a customer for nothing when Apple's gone and changed how their, how their infrastructure works. I mean, you know, it's not our fault. So, but it does happen. It tends to happen everywhere. Um, you know, generally, generally you can kind of plan ahead. It's not usually too bad. The platform and service providers mm -hmm. also do databases and CDN stuff for you. Some do. Yeah. So, what what have you what's made you have to go to your own servers and workspace? Uh, it depends on the customer. But in this example here, I was talking about what one of the customers we've got is called Class App. So they build applications for colleges in the US and these are mostly paid colleges so 
the US system is a bit different. They have like these medical colleges and whatever. So they, they have tens of thousands of students. But the, the difference is we had to build a lot of things that were hardware based. So we, we're creating these PDF files that have digital signage and we're creating um, augmented reality files that you know, have a bunch of Linux scripts that you know, need to be run to be able to generate this stuff. So that's the kind of thing we couldn't really do on a PaaS provider because they didn't offer us that granular control of installing all these libraries and OpenCV and whatever else we needed and, and getting that set up. So that, that's primarily why uh, we go with Rackspace or whoever and, and create a, a, a server environment for that sort of stuff. But if you don't need that, and we've got other customers that don't have, need that control, they just have a PHP API and MySQL database or whatever happens to be, then the PASP solution is perfectly fine. We, we use that every day. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the trade-offs with cross-platform systems. It's generally not, it's generally not the Apple API specifically, or the Android API specifically. It's the third-party stuff. So it's like that Facebook integration or that Twitter integration or whatever. That usually takes a bit more time. And, and you know, they're not a massive company. They don't have the resources of Apple. So it does take them sometimes a little bit of time to catch up with that. But the reality is, you know, there's, a, there's quite a broad community with Titanium. Um, people write native modules for this stuff all the time. You can generally find someone that's written one on GitHub or whatever and use it or fork it. Or do it. It's all open source. So yeah, the, the rules it, are there. It can get a bit dangerous. For instance, when we were trying to um, resolve our publish and install thing for Facebook, so we are just trying to track, registrate, and track app yeah. launches through Facebook, um, we found a module on GitHub. Yeah. And it turned out, I mean, look, looked at the code that they were actually putting it through some Heroku app. Um, <laughs> and we don't know what the hell they're doing with that information. Yeah, well, that's so one of the things to look at with any code from GitHub. <laughs> just make sure it's not uh, not doing something dodgy before you use yeah. it. But, um, you know, that does happen. I mean, that's generally the trickiest part, is any third-party integration can be a pain. Particularly if, like, Urban Airship, you know, there's, there's third-party modules for that sort of stuff. That Urban Airship originally wrote and then stopped supporting it, you know what I mean? So, you know, you, you can't have those kind of issues. But we found on the whole that it's a much better solution for us. It's much more workable than trying to write native apps and, and you know, have twice as much code. And all that. So, anyone else? Yeah. Any situation where you, you wouldn't use Accelerator, like you definitely think that this is going to work. If you need really, if you need really fine control over, say, uh, the hardware, like the camera or video or anything like that, particularly if you're building Accelerator is no good for games. They have a, like a game engine, like a spin-off called uh, Platino, which is basically all OpenGL. But if you're doing anything that's really, really considerably heavy in the graphics department, um, you may consider you know using native instead. I mean, because it's a cross-platform tool, you know, they compile down to, to um, you know, to, to essentially compiled code, but the, the, there's still this bridge, there's still this, you know, JavaScript bridge in between you and you and, um, and the phone. So, I mean, it's always going to be slightly slower. So there's still a sort of JavaScript yeah. runtime where you're having events or? Well, there's a JavaScript they runtime do. in Android, and the way they do it now for iOS is a bit different. They compile it down kind of like Xamarin does, so it compiles down to that iOS, um, interpreted whatever it is, their, their IPIL framework or whatever it is. So they're, they're basically on iOS, the performance is almost exactly on par with the native app. Android is still a bit shitty in cases. They still use like an in-between JavaScript runtime engine, but that's all changing. The, the way they're re-architecting their entire solution, which should come out six months time probably by the end of the year. Is that the Hyperloop? That's the Hyperloop stuff, yeah. Uh, it completely changes that. It moves to more of a Xamarin type framework where you know they're compiling basically straight down to to native code, so it's pretty much equivalent to running, um, you know, a, a native Java application. Do you think going to tether it with their sort of app builder stuff that they released? Do you think they'll be a big player in this, or are they late to the party? I remember them from doing .NET components, but I think they're too late, right. to be honest. I didn't like the .NET components then, so I don't know. But I haven't heard much about them. I don't think they're going anywhere fast, frankly. Um, there's quite a lot of players in this sort of stuff. I mean, there's a lot of small players. There's a lot of uh, sort of phone gap style HTML5 
um, you know, th those sort of platforms and frameworks and things like that. But I think long term, those will get pushed to the side more and more for these interpreted ones like Accelerator and Zamarin and, and a few of the others that are coming up. So I just don't think the performance is there with that kind of HTML5 um, framework. It's good for some stuff, but I think long term, it'll get pushed aside a bit.